Zelf, maar diegene heet ook wel Jennifer, because Jennifer is an amazing name for amazing people who do great stuff. Want what if there is something that you like and you want and you need, but it isn't there? What do you do? You create it, right? You provide it yourself. You're not waiting for that seat at the table. You build your own house. And so did Jennifer. Not me, but Jennifer, the amazing lion, Belle. Jennifer, she is, um, yeah, I switched to English because Jennifer is going to do the talk in English. Jennifer verstaat ook gewoon heel goed Nederlands, maar ze is wel in haar comfort in het Engels. Even kort, zij maakt dus ethisch en inclusieve porno onder andere. Ze geeft hier ook les in. Dus um, ja, boekjes paraat, oortjes paraat. En enjoy this talk with Jennifer Lyon Bell. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me here, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by, in theory, <laughs> that's not right. Um, if someone could come help me with these slides, I would be super delighted, but I can start to say the first part uh, from my heart, which is I want to start by honoring the memory of uh, Professor Dr. Ellen Lan, who left us too early from this world just a couple of months ago. And for many of us here in the sex positive community, she was a colleague and a collaborator and a friend and a role model. And um, as you know, as other people have said, she devoted her career to championing women's pleasure in sex. But also, she conducted pioneering research in the 90s showing that women were aroused by pornography. And that's not news now, but there was a time when it was, and she lent credence um, to this idea, and that affected popular culture, that affected academia, and that also affected um, my work as a filmmaker. So I think her spirit is with us tonight, and, and thank you, Ellen. So let's just have a look here. Um, could someone from Tivoli please show me how this works? This is the most confusing thing I've ever seen. Um, but nonetheless, I'll keep talking. Hello, Tivoli people. Um, let, me, let me share with you. Um, I want to start by talking, I'm going to be talking about ethical porn today and my journey into making ethical porn. And I'd like to start with a story about the first time that I watched porn. Um, my parents were out of town for the afternoon and I had in my hot little hands this tape that I had borrowed from uh, parents of a friend of mine. So I made the room dark and I closed the door and I went over to the VCR and I slipped the tape in and I waited. And it was goofy. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Ellen, thank you, Ellen. She would appreciate the humor. My first porno. So, uh, <laughs> so it was goofy. It was fun. It had a plot. The acting was very stilted. Um, there was choreography, both of the uh, story parts and of the sex parts, but they looked like they were having fun. And I remember thinking like, oh, do those two know each other? Like, have they worked together before? Are they friends? Um, so I, I liked it and I thought it was hot. It was people having sex and I was very excited by that. Um, the one thing I didn't love was the cunnilingus. So when he went down on her, he was moving his head like all over the place. And at that point in high school, when I saw this movie, I had some experience with cunnilingus. I knew what felt good. This did not look to me like it would feel good, but I also knew that women liked different kinds of things. And yet, I thought, I don't think there's any woman who would be really into this. This is for the camera. This isn't for the female performer. And sure enough, when we saw a shot of the female performer, she didn't look that into it. But I thought, okay, I'm just gonna ignore that. And then over the years, I, uh, rented many more films just like this and enjoyed them. And then I went to university. And at Harvard, I got my political consciousness raised. And I heard a lot of different theories about pornography. Um, but the one that spoke most to me was sex-positive feminism. 
And the starting point of sex positive feminism was, unlike what they say in popular culture that porn is just for the pleasure of men, porn is also for the pleasure of women and sexual minorities. And I thought, yeah, me, I like porn. I like porn. Um, and then they went on to say, you know, porn isn't just fun entertainment that we're going to try to take all the, the bad things out of. Porn can have a positive value in society. And the reason is because an essential part of women's liberation is their sexual liberation. And porn, along with things like vibrators, uh, play a key role in letting women explore their desires, find out what they like and don't like, um, find out what their boundaries are, and, and start making a vocabulary to talk to their partners, to bring that into the real world. And through that, they actually get liberation in the world. They feel more powerful, they feel more in control. And I thought, yeah, that's how it is for me too. When I watch porn, I feel like I can speak better with people about what I like and don't like. So I really appreciated this idea that porn could be more than just a bit of fun. And I also did think, huh, I'm a woman. If I were a woman making porn for all different kinds of people, but including other women, maybe that would also have an ethical value in today's society. So even when I was still at Harvard, I started fantasizing secretly that someday I was going to make sexy movies. So when I left school, I went and uh, got a job in the real world, and in my free time, I looked for more porn. Um, so I came across this genre, which at the time was called gonzo. There's still porn now that's called gonzo, but it means something slightly different. But what it meant at the time was that there would be a male cameraman, and he would go out on the town and find a young woman who was willing to come back with him to his hotel room. He would interview her, um, and then maybe she would masturbate solo, and then eventually he'd put the camera on a tripod, and the two of them would have sex together. Um, and I thought these were so hot. And I thought they were hot because they captured something about real life sex that I loved, and that was when you have sex with somebody, you know, once you're with them, you think, okay, something's gonna happen, it's gonna be good, but you don't actually know how it's gonna play out, what's gonna be said, what's gonna be done. It's all a bit of a surprise. And that's how it was with Gonzo films. You didn't really know, like, what was he gonna ask her in the interview? How was she gonna respond? Would she seduce him? Would he seduce her? What kinds of stuff would they do together? And I thought that was super hot. But I had an ethical problem, because sometimes it was fine. Sometimes I thought, oh, they look like they're having fun together, um, and it's clear she could leave whenever she wanted to, so that was great. But then there were other times, and particularly when it was an American uh, cameraman and he would travel to a financially disadvantaged country like in Eastern Europe, that I started to get worried. I would hear this language difference between them, and I would think, does she even know what she's getting into? And then when they would start to get sexual, I would think, you know, is she enjoying this? I can't tell. And then sometimes I was really worried, like, if she doesn't enjoy this, can she leave safely? It's just not at all clear. So I felt terrible watching those movies. Sometimes films would start out looking good and ethical, and then there'd be a turn in the middle and it would go bad. So I really had a hard time finding any gonzo labels that I could trust to give me an ethical experience. And yet, I will admit, I watched it anyway. I just, I loved it so much I watched it anyway, but it, it, but it made me sick and it made me ashamed. Um, so I started to wonder, is it possible to have a film that's hot to me, because I did see some other kinds of films that I just didn't find hot, hot to me and ethical? Is this possible? And eventually I thought, yeah, it is possible, but I can't find any, so I'm just going to have to make it myself. But how do you do that? So I thought about all the people I knew that worked in performance. So my friends in theater, my friends in TV, my friends in film, and the couple friends that I had that were working in different um, genres of pornography at the time. And I asked them all about what their production style was, everything from casting to the way they ran the set. And then I thought about the performers that I had met in person and tried to put myself in their shoes as to what they would like and what would make them feel comfortable. And I came up with a 
point system for myself of guidelines of how to make ethical porn. And I feel really lucky, because I did this a long time ago, and yet these 10 guidelines are still serving me today. So that's really great. Um, the first one is performer-led casting. So, first of all, when I'm casting people, when they approach me, if I think we might work well together, I invite them out for coffee. Taking all potential performers out for coffee is a lot of time. But I find that it's really important because then I can find out why they want to be in a film like the kind that I do. Am I going to be able to give them the experience that they want? And, and what kinds of stuff do they want to do? Is it all going to fit together well. If I do have a sort of formal audition, and I did do such a thing here in Berlin, this is a Berlin casting session I had, I try to make it as low stress for performers as possible and make it clear to them that yes, I am sussing them out as to what their acting style is, but they should be auditioning me too because maybe they don't like the way I work. So um, it's kind of a two-way process where I'm trying to make the performers as important as possible. And most importantly, casting's not about just casting one person. You know, if, if it was just a matter of finding somebody who was charismatic and, and I liked the way they looked, that would be great. But that doesn't matter. For, for performers to be happy, they're going to be working in pairs or more than pairs. Um, so I need to find someone that they click with or it doesn't work. So I'm constantly interviewing different people and looking for connections and asking them what kinds of people would they like to work with. Um, and I can even go so far as to say, hey, is there a performer working in Western Europe that you would like to be with? I could call that person. And people are really jazzed about that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I have been able to do that for people. But even if I can't do that, I can find them like a list of people that I think could be cool. And if they're into any of it, then I set up either an in-person date or a Zoom date so that they can see if they're compatible. Because in the end, them being comfortable with each other, liking each other, and wanting to be with each other sexually is basically the key to the entire movie. So the casting is always worth the effort. The next thing that's important is the story. Um, when I come up with a story or a concept, I check to see, like, okay, what is the message this is sending, and is this a message that I stand behind when it comes to gender relationships, particularly as they affect women? Um, but there's also some positive things that I want to put forward into the world, too, and I try when I can. And one is... Um, uh, that women don't always want love and marriage. So I'm a big champion of like the intimate, connected, one night stand. Um, that women obviously like sexual pleasure and they're not just using sex as a tool to get like, I don't know, a husband or a career or something like that. Um, that there's more than just heterosexual people in the world. So, you know, people are queer and bi and pansexual and the people that are, for example, women loving women, are having a kind of sex that's somewhat different than performers are told to do by male directors who have their own ideas about what lesbians do in bed. So that's really important to me, too. Um, improvisation is something that's really important to me as a person and important to Blue Artichoke Films. Um, I love improvisation because it recaptures some of what I liked in that gonzo porn, which is you don't really know what's going to happen next. They don't know, I don't know, the viewer doesn't know. And um, I do that in a few different ways. One is that once we decide what set we're working on, I first work with the technical crew to find out where are there places that we cannot shoot. So, like, four-fifths of the set you can shoot on, but don't go behind the copper bathtub, that sort of thing. So, I just tell the performers, hey, don't go behind the bathtub, and then the rest of the set is yours to do whatever you want. That's a lot of freedom, and it actually makes a lot more work for the crew, but it's fantastic. Um, it also preserves a sense of flow because I kind of decided, unless there's some really important reason to stop them, like if the camera breaks, which happened once, um, I just let them go because I can always take out later if I feel like something isn't working on camera or 
they accidentally went behind the bathtub or whatever. Um, but if I let them preserve that flow, it's more fun for them, it's more enjoyable, and I think that comes through on camera. And the truth is with improvisation, they come up with stuff that's better than I could have anticipated. I mean, I'm also not picky uh, and over-focused on specific images that I want. There are directors of all kinds who say, I, it has to look exactly like this, this moment, or I won't be happy. I don't really have that, because my experience is the performers are gonna give me something better than I would have demanded, and probably with a lot less effort. So I give them that freedom. Um, and I'd like to show you an example of this. Um, this is a still from my film, Wild Card. Um, I'm gonna show you a clip from Adorn. And Adorn is based on an erotic game. So I gave Sadie Loon and Parker Marks a game with one rule. You start out the film naked, and you can only touch each other over or under clothes that you put on the other person. So we had no idea what was going to happen. Anything could happen. But they're just really creative, interesting lovers. And a lot of stuff happened that I would never have asked for because I did not know it was a thing. It's like not a thing. But they made it a thing. Um, so here is a clip from Adorn. And oh, just for context, um, this is right after he fingered her on the ground, right next to the bathtub, not behind the bathtub, um, and she had this explosive orgasm, and this is the thing that happens next. Freaking great, right? I would never have said to them, <laughs> I would never have said to them, Sadie, could you both get on your knees, and then you reach around, and you jerk them off, and then Parker, could you like sort of dominantly like dominate her head? Like, I would not ask for that, because that's not a thing. But they made it a thing, and it came entirely because of improvisation. Um, fair pay, this is an easy one. Decide on fair pay together, but also give context. Are you being paid for a certain number of days, a certain script as written? Is the partner already confirmed? And just be clear on that, so everybody knows exactly what they're getting into. Supportive crew. Again, this is something I don't think a lot of filmmakers do, but for me it's worth it when I meet crew who are great at their jobs and they want to be part of um, what we do. I see some of our crew right here. Hi, guys. Um, that I force them to go with me for coffee again. Uh, and the reason is because it's so important that crew be supportive of our performers and understand that what we're doing is all in support of the performers, like their happiness and comfort is a number one. And a weird comment or a disrespectful comment could throw off the work of all of us. So I've managed to find people who are great at their jobs and they're also really cool about these things. And as a side benefit, because we all share the same sexual values, they're really cool people and we get along well and it feels a little bit like a family. This was on the set of my film, Second Date, which is a virtual reality movie, and this is the star. Um, details. There are a lot of little things on a set that are really not much trouble for us to arrange, but they make a, a big deal. It's a big deal for the performers on that day. So, like condoms, thanks to our friends at Male and Female for giving us this great Instagram image um, with the condom hats. Con a particular brand of condoms, a particular brand of lube, a particular brand of sex toy, it's no trouble for me to arrange that for the performers, and it makes it much more fun for them. But it can also be things like, do you have enough of the food that you want to eat? A lot of the performers are vegan for some reason. Um, <laughs> um, is there a favorite flavor of tea you want? These are the things that, that are easy to provide and they make a difference with people feeling at home on the set. Diversity is so important in porn because in the different genres of mainstreamish porn that are out there now, there's some very specific ideas of what beauty is. And put together, it's not a very wide range, right? Like, we're missing people of color, we're missing bigger bodies, we're missing visibly disabled people. Um, and I think that, uh, and trans and non-binary people, I think that no film usually ticks all of those boxes, but I like to ask myself, you know, is the film that I'm making contributing in at least one way to a kind of diversity that's missing out there in the pornography that I see? Um, and I'd like to show you a clip um, 
by uh, aorta films. And this is uh, from a wonderful film called Orgy Number 001. Um, consent is very important. This is part of what went wrong in the Gonzo films that I saw. Um, first of all, consent, consent takes place multiple times. So first, way in advance of the shoot, you know, I'm meeting with the performers to find out what they like to do, what they don't like to do. And then when I get them together, we have a conversation, both me with them individually and then with them together about what they would like to do with each other. Um, are there things that are off limits? Are there certain like words that are off limits with each other? Um, anything to look out for? And we get the uh, and what sort of uh, uh, sex uh, safer sex elements they'd like to use, and what kind of tests that they would feel comfortable if their partner did advance. And we lay that all out. Then on the day of the shoot, we do it again because. On that day, you might be in a different mood. So if we agreed that things were going to be really rough, but you're not into it, like that, that could happen. And um, you know, we want to make a shift to something that you guys are into. So it happens a second time. But then, you know, consent isn't just something that happens before the shoot. It happens all the way through. So I make it clear, hey, you know, if in the moment you're not feeling it, like if you need a change, we can just stop, you know? We can stop and you guys can talk about what you would like to do together and we'll just renegotiate it. And whatever the two of you is good for the two of you, I'm pretty sure I'll be fine with it. Um, and that makes performers feel good to hear, as does it when I say, you know what, if, just so you know, if you, know, you started to feel triggered or you weren't feeling good or you just weren't into it anymore, we're gonna stop, we won't make this film. I'm only making this film if both of you are really into it. And I think that's important to communicate. This is me on the set of Matinee having that consent conversation with um, the performers. Um, showing pleasure, particularly women's pleasure, is obviously super important to me. This kind of gets back to that cunnilingus problem from uh, the movie I saw when I was a teenager. Movies, I guess I should say. Um, but fortunately, this kind of solves itself. I was so worried before I started directing, how will I know that the imagery is like feminist enough? Um, you know, that I'm showing women a good something, I don't know. Um, but what I discovered is it's kind of a non-problem given the way that I shoot. So, for example, um, if I cast the kind of performers who are very creative with their sexuality and, and know how to speak up for what they want with each other, and if I give them improvisational freedom on the set so that they can do exactly what they want, you know what? And, and also, just to be clear, that they've said in their uh, intake that they are interested in experiencing real pleasure on the porn set, because some people don't want to do that, but the people that I work with usually do. Um, if they're willing to do all those things, and they really like their co-performer, and they get with their co-performer, some great stuff is gonna happen. There will be some pleasure. So as long as all the cameras don't break, we're gonna capture, uh, we're gonna capture that. So I can relax and just let them do their thing and do my best to capture it. And as a bonus, if I'm interested in diversity, well, the people that I cast are diverse. They, they have all different things they're interested in. So by capturing what they really like, we're gonna get some diversity. So women who orgasm silently, um, people, women who prefer uh, fingering to penis and vagina sex, or people who really like a sex toy that really doesn't come first to mind. These are all things that have been in my movies, specifically because performers requested them. And I'd love to show you a film clip of great cunnilingus. Uh, this is by the filmmaker Gooden Green, who is a still photographer who became a filmmaker. And this is from her series called The Shutter Series. This is from the second film called Second Shutter. If you like, you can see more of Gooden Green's amazing work at goodengreen.com. I know I have. Um, and the last point, the, the tenth point in my ten point guidelines of how to make ethical porn is trust. I like to say that I have a trust-based 
production system. And what I mean by that is, if I have done my job in finding the kind of performers who, um, who share my values around sexuality and are open to experiencing this on the set, um, you know, I put my trust in them that they are gonna do something interesting and it's gonna be great and I don't worry them about it or worry myself about it. And I hope that if I treat them with respect and that they can see this trust that I have in them, that they will return that trust and trust me. And then we can have sort of a collaborative process that is much more than the sum of its parts. And I think a great example of that is in the film I made called Silver Shoes. Silver Shoes is a trilogy of three different films that are all about the erotic power of clothing, but the films are interconnected. And um, I want to show you the trailer for the movie and then tell you a story about the red-headed performer, Annabelle Lee. So you can see some shots of Annabelle in there, the red-headed performer. Um, so what happened was in The House Sitter, which is the second uh, short story, she, the idea was that she's in somebody's house, it's probably her ex-lover's house, she wraps herself in the blazer of her ex-lover, and then she masturbates. And the idea was that she would, you know, be thinking about that person. Um, we started shooting the scene, and almost instantly, Annabelle's eyes filled with tears, and she looked really distressed. And I thought, oh my God, what's going on? So I said, cut, and I went over and said, hey, Annabelle, are you okay? What's going on? And she said, well, you're not gonna believe this, but, the cologne on the jacket that you've given me to work with happens to be the same cologne as my ex-boyfriend, and we just broke up, and this is giving me a lot of feelings. And I said, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Like, should we stop? We can stop. And she said, well, if you'd be up for it, what I'd prefer is could I just roll with it? Could we just like start again and I'll just see where it goes? And I said, wow, if, if that's safe for you, then yeah, let's do it. So we started all over and it was amazing. She wept throughout the scene and then by the time it was over, it was so cathartic that she started laughing. And I've never seen anything like it. And if I worked for a big porn company, they might say, yeah, you can't have crying in your movie, but who cares, because I'm independent and I can do what I want, and I loved that crying. <laughs> and I, I'm grateful to Annabelle that she trusted me and, and that I trusted her, and together we made something much better than I would have anticipated. So that's pretty much it. I mean, since uh, the time that I have left, uh, since the time that I started this, other people have come. They've started making ethical porn as well. Even if we haven't met each other, we have similar values and, and similar ways that we do it. Um, it's understandable if you don't know any of these filmmakers because we're in this gray area between cinema films and and mainstream porn, it's hard to find platforms that are ethical, that we believe in. We get kicked off of social media a lot. Um, that's why I built my own platform, blueartichokefilms.com. I also really like pinklabel.tv. They have my work as well as a number of other filmmakers. And you know, if you're looking for a place to find ethical porn, if they say they make ethical porn, look for the page that tells you why. What exactly are they doing? And see if you believe in this list. But I've been happier doing this than I ever thought possible. It's wonderful having my you know, creative values and my political values and my sexual values in line with my ethics. And so to come back to the question of whether or not it's possible to make ethical porn that's also hot, and by the by, you end up getting a wonderful crew of friends to hang out with. Is it possible to do this? The answer is, it takes a bit more time, it takes a bit more creativity, but you absolutely can. Thank you very much. <laughs>